Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you're at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. It's podcast episodes just like this that help us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS communities and the LGBT community and public at large. We thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand a topic that impacts each of us. Uh, if you're listening to a podcast episode like this, it's likely because you've met yourself at this intersection. And again, we want to thank you for giving us a few moments to uh, explore a topic that means something to our guests today and also to their family members. The Latter Day Stories podcast is given in a video and audio version. If you are watching on a video version, we invite you to share your comments and share this episode. One of the great parts about social media is it gives us the ability to interact in real time. So if you feel something, have a comment, or want to uh, participate in this discussion, and you are on our Facebook channel, we invite you to share your comments below. Sharing the episode on your personal wall or in a group uh, setting also helps us to spread this message. If you are listening on the audio version through one of our audio players, like Stitcher, Google, I, uh, iTunes, or iHeartMedia, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. Subscribing to the channel and giving us a rating also helps to uh, boost the Latter Gay Stories podcast and allows it to become more visible in more spaces. Again, uh, we thank you for participating in this episode and invite you to share and to participate. Without further ado, I want to welcome to our podcast um, three men, three fathers of, in fact, it's all gay sons. Yes. I just realized that. Yes. So you're all dads of, of gay sons. Um, first, Eric McDonald. Tim Strong and Todd McCoy. We got everybody. And first and foremost, we have the the goal of making Todd say at least fifty words. That was the charge that came from your wife. <laughs> we'll see. So we're, no, we're down two. That's right. This is a this is a unique panel, um, and I will have each of you introduce yourselves, but. Uh, a unique panel of dads that come from a wide variety of, of experience and stories. And as we kind of discussed this, this subject and, and doing a podcast episode like this, it was important that we just kind of bring a wide variety of experience to allow our viewers and our listeners to better understand this experience, whether it's from ground zero, middle zero, or a little bit of a long-term um, experience. In yeah. the, with the McCoys. So I, I really just want you to be open and vulnerable and, and share your, your experience. The one thing I don't want you to do is feel like you're boxed in or pressured by the message, that this is a topic that is constantly changing, and this is a topic that, that we continue to become better at as we learn. And, and I just want you to be able to share your experience exactly where you're at today, and then also know that um, what you have learned, the, the good things that you've done in this space, and also the not so good things, are things that we can openly share. Probably one of the most difficult parts of this topic is the fact that so much of this has been taboo. So much of this we've avoided talking about, and because of that, it results in mistakes, and sometimes that means a separation and relationship, or years that it takes to rebuild in order to get to the places we're at today. So. Um, let, I guess let's get to know you a little bit better. We'll start with you, Eric. Sure. First, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found yourself on the couch. So I come from a pioneer stock of LDS members. I think my grand, great-great-grandfather became a Mormon back in like the 1850s. And... So we've just had a, we've had a large uh, history of Mormonism in our family. My wife's family is very similar to that. Uh, Liz and I met at BYU, and we moved down to the Mesa, Arizona area. I began working as a lawyer, and I work as a, as a lawyer in Mesa, Arizona. Um, I would say it's, it's been about five years that our son came home from a mission, and within a year of coming home from his mission, he came out to us as gay. And that's where Liz and I became involved in this particular space. And that's why I'm on the couch. 
Perfect. Tim. Yeah, so Tim Strong and uh, uh, somewhat similar in terms of uh, uh, family background. A lot of pioneer stock on my dad's side of the family and my mom's uh, from uh, England and a couple generations there as well. But uh, our son uh, was, you know, as a teenager, was just one of those, uh, you know, kids that, right, you couldn't ask for a better kid. He was the rock solid, uh, by the book, uh, LDS young man. Uh, just a phenomenal a kid, easy to raise, uh, bright, everything. He went on a mission. And uh, in fact, uh, when uh, President Monson had announced the, that the mission age for young men would change from 19 to 18, as soon as he heard it, he says, I'm, I'm going when I'm 18 right away. You know, it wasn't, he's just one of those kids. Uh, but <clears throat> a couple years after he got home from his mission, he um, had a, he was at BYU and he had a, I would call it a, dep a depression episode, a real, that made my wife and I very concerned. Uh, about two years into, into his uh, stand at BYU after coming home from his mission, he came out to us and, and that's how we're here. And that was probably about, well, I'm thinking it's like three and a half years ago now. Yeah. So five years? About five Eric, years, yes. Three and a half years? I think so. Todd, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name's Todd McCoy and uh, I'm one of the real ones. My mother wasn't, uh, was a pioneer. My dad wasn't. My son came out to me uh, about, um, I guess when he turned about 15, he was having problems at school. People kind of harassing him and everything else. And we told him, get with it. You know what you're doing. He's about six foot six and weighs about 300 pounds now. He's pretty good kid and uh, we talked with him about it told him well there's people around here we can have you date other women and it took me about 30 minutes up in our uh, game room in our house and he's saying well I, this is dad I'm not I like women but I'm gay and I sat there and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And I said, well, that's it is what it is. So we'll support you in it. And uh, so then my wife got in to Mama Dragons and it started going, you know, all over the place now, so. What is it that you do for an occupation? I'm a, um, Building superintendent. So three unique situations and two lawyers on the couch. What are Indeed. the odds? What are the odds? If you don't want gay children, avoid <laughs> don't be a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Small sample size, but we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, yeah, let's jump into some coming out stories. Um, and not necessarily sh um, taking the limelight from your sons, but it's interesting how parents also have a coming out story. Mm. And trying to better understand this. So before we jump into the revelation where your sons came out, uh, let's first talk about um, a little history, a little background. What yeah. did you know about this topic prior to your children coming out? And let's talk the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sure. Um, because we all have an intersection in Mormonism and the church has a um, checkered past when it comes to understanding this topic. It's, it's just transformed so much over the years. So your initial thoughts prior to coming out, what, um, what, were your view, what were your views on this topic? You want me to go? Sure. So when I was in law school, I was more of a conservative uh, bent. My parents were, so I was. And when I finished law school and began practicing in Mesa, maybe it was my area of the law or not, I don't know, but I began to shift. I, I noticed I began to care a little bit more about certain social issues. And pretty quickly, I, I became intrigued with the idea that, um, I, I remember reading in the end sign of one of the, it might have been President Hinckley, I can't really remember, I think I've gone back to look for it, but the statement was, hey, you can be gay and be a member of the church, and you can even have a temple recommend. And I remember my father-in-law talking to me a little bit about that. Um, but 
that's kind of where it ended. And I, I knew I was really intrigued with that issue. As, as gay marriage became kind of important, I was very supportive of that particular social right. Um, but I never would have thought that I would have to deal with that issue. And I have to say that despite the, the so-called preparation, it's still a shock for a, a dad to all of a sudden realize that his first son is not gonna have kids, not gonna get married, not to have those, you know, not, not have all, all of that narrative that I had previously written in my head about what my kids were gonna do. And so um, even though I was very supportive of, of gay marriage and gay rights and civil rights, to me that's what it was, um, I was not prepared to be a parent of a gay kid at the very beginning, and that was, that was shocking. Mm. Todd, you're probably the, old, the oldest on the couch, and you work in a profession that's rough. Yes, I do. The clientele is uh, opinionated. <laughs> yes. What uh, What were your thoughts prior to Blue coming out? Trying to get him um, out of where he was, it was high school he was going to and uh, get him somewhere where people weren't picking on him and, and uh, calling him gay and all this other stuff, more than just gay, but um, just trying to be around him and, and uh, be ble I'm blessed with him as my son now. What, uh, yeah. do, you, do you remember any, any historical church teachings contrary to your own personal experience that you had to battle within yourself. And I can understand, and maybe I should preface this, if you, I mean, I'm a father also, if I knew my son was being bullied for a certain reason, it seems like I would probably try to better understand that topic a little bit. Did, did you have any of those experiences? Um, not really, it took me about, like I say, about 30 minutes to realize he is what he is. He says he's gay. I tried to put a woman, you know, you can date this woman, you can date this woman. He says, Dad, do you understand what I am? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I guess, I guess you're right. You, you know what you are, let's go with it. And that's, I just realized he's gay and that's what he's gonna be the rest of his life. Tim, what about, uh, what, you sh were shaking your head a lot when Eric was explaining. Well, I don't know, just what, what uh, I connect and in, in, with both of these men, when it resonates with me, but you know, I, I, I'm pretty, I have been pretty socially conservative, uh, but on the other hand, I, I've, I've never been a, a flamethrower, so to speak, you know, I was never strident about any of my views on, on the gay rights or anything, but probably the best way I could relate where I came from was just through two quick stories, which one is that um, in one of the conversations I had with my son after his coming out, I felt it was important for me to ask him, Mark, uh, w I need you to think, I asked him, will you, will you think about this and let's have a conversation. I want you to tell me how, all the things I did to screw, to screw you up on this issue when, 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 when you were growing up. I need to know, I told Mark, I need to know. I need to know exactly how, uh, you know, my influence uh, hurt or helped you growing up and what I did to cause you pain. And, uh, you know, it, it, at some level I was heartened that I, what, that Mark's feedback to me was that I wasn't a flamethrower. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, he, and he related in specifically, he remembered an instant where we were sitting around in the kitchen apparently, and one of my other kids had asked me, what would you do if you found out one of your kids was gay? And according, I don't remember this, but the way Mark tells it, uh, I paused for a good while and eventually said, well, I would just want to uh, get him some help because I would love him. Um, and so Mark took that to mean, well, dad thinks there's something wrong with it, but, you know, he's not going to hate me or anything. You know, so that was one story. It was a little window into me. And the other story, uh, I'll just relate real quick, was I was the... Uh, first counselor in the Young Men's Presidency, 
And right after the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision, uh, we were tasked with uh, kind of spending 10 minutes at the beginning of our uh, quorum lessons to kind of download uh, the church's view on same-sex marriage. Um, and so I guess since I was the, I had an advisor, but I guess since I was the lawyer, he figured I was the one to do that. <laughs> And I remember, you know, I wish I, could, I, wish I had a, vi a camera to go back and, because it was before my son had come out. And I wish I had a camera on me to know exactly what I did. But I, uh, I think I kind of just explained, you know, the church has this view of marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, but, and so I sort of explained as best I could what I thought was the kind of procreative reason for that. But I, I remember also saying, uh, but this has nothing to do with how we treat people and um, that, that we love and are kind to everyone type thing. And I remember a young man, we, they were seated in two rows, and there was a young man in, in the class who, uh, who said, you know, he said, you know, we, there's, there's a way to solve this. And I, and I said, what's that? He said, we just throw them all in the ocean, you know? And what I'll never forget is there was a young man sitting right behind him, in sort of the row behind him, whose entire visage just looked like he was going to, you know, he, he just looked like he wanted to shrink into a hole. And I guess, I think to my credit, although I felt uncomfortable with it at the time, I read that kid the riot act in front of all his peers and, and told him that's no, that's no way to ever speak about anyone. Um, but, you know, I have so many conflicting feelings about that episode because I, I, I feel proud of the way I you know, told him that was inappropriate, but I, I, uh, clearly I was in a very different place about understanding, right, what, what it really means, what, the, what it really means to uh, advocate for, for uh, equal rights in marriage and in other things, so. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you felt like you were adequately prepared to have a gay child. Okay, spoiler alert for those who are listening on the audio version. No hands were raised. <laughs> yeah, no. Where do we turn? Where do we find? So we all have an intersection in Mormonism. Um, where do we find resources to navigate this topic? Well, even five years ago, there weren't really any. Now there's your podcast, there's Richard's Richard Osler's podcast, there's Jill Rowe's podcast, um, there are support groups. Um, so there, there's a lot more resources now to learn how to be a parent. Uh, there's the I'll Walk With You site that, that my wife and oh, Tim's actually one of the moderators on that group. Um, we just kind of made a little bit of change there. And, and, and that's just a really good place for parents to go. So there are so many more resources today than there was even five years ago. I didn't, I didn't know of, I don't think there was anything uh, other than maybe all. We found out about the all group in Arizona. Which but, is an Arizona-based group. But there really wasn't on the, anything on the website, and I couldn't read anything about it. In fact, you know what? I remember when my son came out, um, I had kind of, I've got, I'd got, I, I took my, I uh, deactivated my Facebook page and started a, another Facebook page with a fake name. And um, I tried to become a mama dragon, because I thought, okay, here's, here's a group of people who, who ha are parents of gay kids. And um, one of the people who was responding at the time said, oh, sorry, you're not allowed to be a mama dragon because you're a man. <laughs> and so um, I haven't met her yet, but she's a, I've, I've connected with her on Facebook, and she's a super nice lady. The gatekeeper kept you out. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but I mean, I was, I was reaching for everything at that point in time. I remember going back into my office and having tears. I have, a, I have a couple of gay employees, and one of them happened to walk in when I was kind of blubbering a little bit, and I talked to him about my son, and he just was so comforting, and he just said, you know, um, the good thing is, is we haven't really been loved very much, so we're really easy to love. And it just kind of helped change my perspective and realize that I could, I could do this. I, I did need a few days, though, to, to, get past some, to get past the narrative that I had written. 
I think uh, I think you bring up a great topic that we should spend a little time in, in, in terms of resources, uh, and es especially in a Latter Day Saint con context where there's a lot of pressure being put on the saints to explore only approved sources for information. Yeah. Um, as fathers, knowing that each of you navigated this journey somewhat blindly, um, without much information on as official statements for the church. Um, where can the church, where are their blind spots? What could the church have done better? I mean, currently they have a website. There's a, there's a website available under the same sex attracted heading at, uh, the, at churchofjesuschrist.org. Um, but there's some harmful messaging there currently saying that the hallmark quote is the official PR statement that elders Wickman and Oaks gave, which include language that says, don't take your children out in public. Don't invite them over as lengthy house guests. Yeah. Don't um, ask. Don't allow them to spend additional time at your home. Don't encourage them to have jobs where they would work directly with children. A lot of harmful messaging that isn't reflective of your son's experiences. So, where uh, just maybe a two thronged, two pronged question. Where should Latter-day Saints turn for good, healthy information? And also, where is the church seeing some blind spots? And, and where does a little extra light need to be shined? Mm. That's a good answer for Tim. <laughs> well, for Tim. I mean, my initial reaction to that is that they should turn to God and to each other. To fan right? I mean, if I think about myself, uh, my, my most significant support structures were talking to my son. Well, I should say listening to him. I mean... I remember when he came out to me, there was just a lot more hugging and listening than anything else because I was afraid to be, that I was going to say something stupid. Not just stupid, but really harmful. And I was worried about all the harmful things I'd already said. So I think lit, just listening to our... You know, if, if you have a loved one who's LGBTQ, just to spend a lot of time asking questions that they're comfortable with and listening. Uh, and then if, you're, if you don't have a loved one... Uh, uh, listen podcasts podcasts like yours or i mean i've, I've listened uh, richard osler's podcast has been a wonderful blessing to me um you know i'll walk with you the has been probably the the greatest source of support for me as a parent and you know in, in terms of the church i think it's um you know i've encountered such a wide range of of things in the church from from you know the, the, you know, the worst homophobia you, you can imagine to just beautiful, sacred experiences with, with folks in the church. And I think have, just having conversations with, uh, with people, sharing, our, sharing my experience, listening, we, you know, we, we get a long way by hearing stories. I think stories change, change, change hearts and lives more than anything. So if the, I think if the church could, I think the church is probably improving in this area, but if the church could just, uh, you know, allow people to tell unvarnished stories of how of what what it's really like whether it's as a parent or or a, or a, a member of the lgbt community to hear unvarnished stories because sometimes they, they do they they sort of get picked for you know uh, that certain sweet spot sometimes we know we know that we see that sure. and those are valuable but every story every story matters every story changes a heart i think and that's consistent with uh, elder ballard's call in 2017 yeah. at byu he said as latter day saints we are not doing a good job at listening to and understanding the experiences of the lgbtq community and he didn't say latter day saints divide yourself from the lgbtq community he didn't say run away from he said we have to do better than we're doing mm -hmm. today yeah. And we must, we must better understand the, the experiences and the stories. So I, I, I like that, what you're saying, Tim, that, that those stories are important. And not only are they, is it sage advice from a couple dads, but uh, an apostle also believes that the church can do much better, the members can do much better mm -hmm. at understanding this space and not feeling so taboo. You know, I don't know if I want a program by the church because I just don't think they're ready to provide the right type of program if but I would like the freedom as a parent to be asked to help teach uh, members of the church this experience and and to bring out those stories um, uh, it really needs to be directed by people who are involved as opposed to people who aren't involved 
it's really hard to uh, divine what it's like being gay until you actually talked to a son or a friend or somebody who is gay, gay who can give you that experience or trans or me. I can't tell. I can't tell people how to. Oh, this is what it's like to be gay. I can tell people what it's like to be a gay parent, but I don't need another parent telling me, you know, to, to put the program together. It needs to be. That's the blind spot in the church is we don't have a, a decent place where parents can run with this to help educate and enlighten the co-membership. I think that makes a lot of sense too because we see, we see that blind spot just in terms of callings. We don't see a lot of gay members, no. lesbian members participating in leadership callings and because of that visibility um, is non-existent. And we run them out. We, and so we don't have good examples. And so we're really far behind there. There was nobody for my son and probably no place for, for, for Blue to, there, there's nobody for them to look up to and say, hey, I can make this work. There's only all the people who couldn't make it work. And, yeah. and so until we get something where parents are involved and, and, members, and, and gay members who are still involved in the church are the ones doing it, um, Without, without like certain restrictions or, I just don't think we need, we don't need, quote, leadership to tell us how to tell these stories. I think we're pretty good at it nowadays. I wanna jump into your story a little bit, Todd, because you said when Blue came out, um, your first reaction was to recommend a mixed orientation <laughs> marriage. Right. Why is that? <laughs> That's, I grew up, you know, you get married, to the same sex, or not the same sex, to <laughs> You're the, opposite, the opposite sex. I already like how we indoctrinated you with our great gay agenda. <laughs> and uh, so all along after I uh, figured it out, I said, well, God put uh, my son on the planet for us to raise as he is. And if he's gay, he's gay. If he's not, he's, he's straight. Can be he can be this he can be that but it's your son you're the father raise him best you can i think if i ask this question and ask you to raise your hand i think i'm going to get everybody's hand to raise and when your sons first came out whose first reaction was or in that initial conversation was let's try to make a mixed orientation marriage work or have you explored all of those options did any of that run through your brain at that ran through the brain yes i very deliberately didn't let it outside of my brain because I knew I didn't know enough. Yeah. You, you know, I went for a walk. When Matthew, when Matthew came back from his mission, um, he tried to date a girl who, who came back from the mission the very same day. Cute girl, good friends. And he said in, in his head, if he could make it work, it was going to be with this girl. And they dated for about a week, and then they stopped dating. And all of a sudden, I'm, you know, he's, he's talking about hypotheticals about being gay. He, he never admitted he was gay at first. It was just all hypothetical. And we went on a walk, and he said, well, do you think I can marry a woman? And honestly, I had never even thought about a gay person marrying a woman. I, I didn't know that that existed, really. I, I guess I didn't know any gay men who were married to straight women, but... As a heterosexual man, I thought, well, of course you could if that's what you want to do, because I did. And if I did, someone else could. I had never thought about, well, could you marry a man? That was just another I had never mm. thought about that particular question. Mm. And, you know, no, that would, that would have been a struggle. If that, was, if that was required to be a member of the church, I, think, I don't think I'd be a member of the church. It would be really hard to be a member of the church and, and have that requirement. So... Honestly, but I also have to admit that I almost thought, oh, wow, maybe this is the answer. <laughs> and in my head, I, but I didn't, it, it just didn't connect. I, the only thing I did say was, well, if, if that is your course, you're going to have to have fidelity with it, just like everybody else has to have fidelity in their marriage. And so, yeah, as long as you have fidelity. And that's the only, that's about the only good answer I could come up with because I just mm -hmm. had never even thought about it. Okay. I mean, Kyle, as I think through, through as uh, Eric's been talking here, um, 
my, my immediate reaction is I didn't know, but within a matter of a couple months, I had had more conversations yeah. with my son, and I'll, I'll, re I'll always remember, because it was a transformative experience for me when I first asked him when he knew he was gay. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, when I was a teenager, I knew I liked boys and not girls, probably like you do. And he said, but I knew, but I knew I wasn't gay. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I'm Mormon. I couldn't be gay. <laughs> and, yeah. right? I, mean, yeah, that's I, that, I just, that, you know, so that just breaks my heart to the, you know, I mean, I'll, mm -hmm. you know, he, 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 he didn't believe he could be himself because he was Mormon and, I had something to do with that, probably. I mean, like I said, I wasn't a flamethrower. I never was, but I obviously had those uh, conservative views that I've probably expressed that informed how he felt that like that way. And but you know, that conversation was transformative for me because, you know, intellectually, I I could accept that uh, sexual orientation wouldn't generally be something that was chosen. But it wasn't until my son right looked me in the eyeballs and said, "This is who I am. God made me this way." And I knew, I believed him, right? I, I, he's my son. I believe my son. I love my son. And I could never see, I've never been able to see the issue the same ever since. The, the sort of exercise of being able to try to put your brain in someone else's shoes and walk a little bit and flipping the world around and asking, could I, could I if, the, if the church or anyone else asked me to live a celibate life because, and not, not to marry my sweetheart, I, could I do it? No, I doubt it. And so... Uh, that changed me forever, that conversation. And I would have, so on the mixed orientation marriage, that was, to me, that was out, out the window at that point. And I, and I think you're, you're touching on a point that I think is just pure and valid, and that is, um, it's one thing to have rhetoric and teaching and tradition and culture within Mormonism. It's another to know someone. Mm -hmm. When you're directly impacted by this topic, it seems like the whole world changes. And this, this school of the prophets, which literally is at your kitchen table, it has the ability to teach us so much more than kind of what you alluded to, Eric. I have a whole bunch of people who are telling me what this experience should be like, having no experience on this side of the aisle. And sometimes being, on, being the one in this conversation who identifies as gay, um, we've heard the rhetoric, we've heard the doctrine, we know it often better than some of our parents did because we ingested it and we lived by it. And kind of like your son, um, he, he, you just consume it. But yet, I'm being told all these things by people who don't know what this other side of the aisle looks like, and it's hard to trust that. So I, I understand that, and I, and I think that's a beautiful part of, of, of this conversation. Todd, I wanna, um, each of you, I wanna talk a little bit about after your sons came out, what were your conversations like with your wife? When, when the lights faded, the, the curtains had closed, and you had those opportunities to have a candid conversation, what did you and Cher discuss? I don't think we really discussed a lot. I basically, half an hour after he came out, it was, that's my son, that's what I'm gonna go with, and, and I know he's got uh, six other brothers and a, a sister, and they all accepted him. And I said, "That's, you know, he's my son." Did you go into some type of a defense mode, like a, a protective father mode, that says, "Okay, we now know something more about Blue that we didn't know before. How do we support him? How do, how do we protect him from the that society that continues to bully him?" Were, were there anything that you collaborated with with your wife? to try to, ways that you tried to support Blue? Well, I think said, don't be bullied, fight back. That's what I was saying. He's big enough, he, def he can defend himself, and uh, he went to karate school and everything, growing up, so he could defend himself, but he didn't want to do it. And I said, if it comes to that point, let him know who's, you know, who's running this business. You know, you're gay, you're gonna be gay. That's all there is to it. Accept it and own it. Right. Mm -hmm. Tim. Gosh, my, 
our experience was maybe a bit the opposite. It's like, what didn't we talk about? I mean, you know, to, for both my wife and I, our, our, I think the two uh, most important elements of our relationship to the gospel and to the church are Jesus Christ and forever families. And so you, the way you imagine you're the future for your son at that point changes, right? All the dreams you had of your son marrying in the temple, uh, you know, and what you're imagining as far as the, the wife and the kids and the grandkids and, um, and where, do, where does it fit in? What, how, is this fair? Why is this fair to Mark? He doesn't get to be with someone he loves. You know, like, like every question imaginable. And... Um, uh, my wife is just one of those people who just feels deeply like, I mean, her life revolves around her children and she's a stay at home mom and just one of those uh, rock star moms. And she felt all this deeply. She loved, she, she probably had the stronger relationship with my son growing up because of some common interests in, in, in the arts and that sort of thing. Uh, so, so it was just, I mean, honestly, from a parent's perspective, it was both, uh, spirit, a spiritual experience in the sense that it gave me, especially as a dad, a connection to my son because I understood him. In fact, I, it strengthened my relationship with Mark, definitely. But behind the scenes, there was a lot of pain in trying to figure out what does this mean for me and my relationship to God, to the church, to, to all these things that I hold uh, in a more in, in a dear place, right at the core of my soul. What does it mean? And they and those were very hard questions, and continue to be. There's a lot. I wrestle dissonance on these issues all the time, and so does so does Martha. We, um, my wife, uh, she. Um, but you know, we've we've grown a lot though, and I'm and I wouldn't I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything for the for what I've learned, and the and the connection I've formed with my son that I wouldn't have otherwise. Eric, you and Liz. So we had inklings that Matthew was gay when he was about a junior in high school. And Liz flat out asked him, are you gay? And he said no. And then he went on a mission and, um, and, and during that initial period of time, I was um, I kind of was ignoring it away. I guess I just, it, 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 again, I wasn't, I was okay with gay people and, and people who were, and gay people being married. I couldn't understand what it was like. I didn't, I, I, I didn't really want to experience um, being a dad of a gay kid and, and having that. And so I just, I guess I just ignored it away. My wife was, was, the devil's trying to get my son, and and going through this prayer relationship with her heavenly Father, to where at some point it was, you know, protect my son at first from Satan to let me be the best mom I can to my son, no matter what, and that was her prayer by the time he came home, and and when he came home and we had that dis that, that discussion that first week. He went off to BYU, and again, I was kind of, I remember him looking through pictures, and I saw a girl picture with a bikini on, and I was kind of, oh yeah, he's recovered, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's better now, or something, and, and then he went to BYU, and um, I, kept, I kept texting him, hey, she's cute, she's cute, and he goes, I'm working on it, I'm dealing with it, I'm trying to work on things, and, but but still there was no relationship happening. And I, just, I, I kept ignoring it. Liz kept working on prayer with Heavenly Father. And then, and then he came home. And um, again, it didn't take us very long to fully support him. Had to go through the grieving process, but it didn't take us very long, a couple of weeks. And at that point in time, it was most important thing is our family. And most important thing is is supporting him and being there for him and that was a pre it, the transition was easier once once we stopped worrying about how all the other stuff works we just wanted to interface with our our son as if religion didn't matter and and that put us in a position of peace religion's going to take care of itself all of our all of our beliefs are going to take care of ourselves the most important thing is maintaining that relationship with our son 
because my son was suicidal, I felt up at BYU, and I wanted my son around. Mm. And I like how you brought up the a grieving process. You had to go through that grieving process. I think that ties directly mm. into what you were talking about, Tim, that, that disconnect from, but we were supposed to be an eternal family. Yeah. This is the eternal bond. This is the celestial yeah. part of the, the reason why we're so invested in our faith. And there is that real life grieve, grieving process. But, and there, that, that, that had to be grieved too. We, I, had to, I had to rethink, I, I had to realize that God's gonna make all of this other stuff work out. I have to make this work out. It is the, my wife has to make the epitome of the, we hope for all things, we believe all things. We also believe that there is continuing revelation, yeah. this, that there are yet to be revealed things that we don't fully yeah. understand today. And, and we have to err on that side. I want to talk a little bit about coming out and not necessarily your son's coming out, <laughs> but your individual coming out stories where you had to come out to friends and family, um, that you are now parents of a gay child. Um, Todd, let's we'll start with you. In, in your family, in, in the construction world, um, what was your experience like making that first declaration and then letting people know that Blue was gay? I just flat out told them my son's gay and wow. you either like him or you don't. I've got a, another son that owns a company that uh, all uh, three of my other brothers work for, for him. And uh, he trains them and everything else, and everybody knows he's gay. The people that work with him are straight, and but they just love him. They love working with him. And he's just, I mean, he, everybody, you know, goes, goes to work with him, and, and he's just well-liked. There's something you know. to be said about that, that instead of maybe treating this topic with kid gloves or a sensitive nature, <clears throat> jumping right in and just accepting. And, and that's probably, there's a great lesson. I can't help but just listen to you and watch you talk and think, you remind me a lot of Boyd Packer, just the looks of Boyd. And I think, <laughs> what would it be like if Boyd Packer was <clears throat> as stringent as he was right. when it comes to this topic, if he was just loving and and as forgiving and open in this topic as you are with your son, how much more progress we could make in this, this arena? That's, it is what it is, that's what I said. You're not gonna change him, so love him, be father, and support him. You support the rest of your kids, he's part of your, your children. Tim? Yeah, so I, I would say I, probably the two primary ways in which I came out were, uh, number one, I was, I was on the high council at the time that, the, that Mark came out and for about the next eh, two and a half, three years. And I believe that even before uh, Mark had come out to the world, I was talking about um, LGBTQ issues from the pulpit every time I spoke as a high counselor. And, Usually subtly, just as a sneak in, maybe a reference to the lesbian couple around the corner in a, in a talk about, you know, a funny cat story or something like that. But I decided, you know, uh, this needs to be normalized. People need to be able to talk about uh, LGBTQ folks uh, in ways that aren't negative. Yeah. I think, all, you know, when I thought about it, I thought almost all of the references I've heard growing up to LGBTQ folks in the church have been negative. It's always around you know, proclamation of the family and love chastity and, and destroying the, the family and honestly, all kinds of messages like that. And, and I thought, well, okay, I, I know something now, even though, even though Mark's not out, I'm gonna just start talking about it. And uh, I remember the first couple of times I did it, I, you know, I, 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 well, every time I did it, I had people come in and talk to me about it afterwards. Uh, and people were just thirsty for people to just normalize it and just talk about it. Connect with. Connect with it. Yeah. So that was one way, and then the other way uh, was once Mark was ready uh, for the family to know, my wife and I had a uh, conversation one-on-one -on -one with every single one of my uh, seven siblings, her six siblings, and our parents. Uh, so that was, what, one, two, four, 15 different conversations, uh, some in person, some by phone. Uh, 
and uh, so that we did that. Yeah, we 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 wanted them all to know, and because part of it was we wanted them to accept Mark. I mean, my wife's uh, big deal was this is not going to destroy my family. That was how she felt it, and so she, and so she that was very important to her, and we we made that effort with every single one of our family members. Yeah, good proactive approach. Yeah, we were in. <clears throat> Uh, some complicated space when Matthew came out after the, the fir after the year of BYU. One, he still had two more years at BYU, and I was very nervous that if he had come out publicly, something might happen to, to him at BYU with regard to graduating from BYU. And so, and, and the other complicated issue was my my second oldest son, he was on a mission up in Idaho. And we didn't really want to tell my son that his brother was gay on the phone. Um, and we knew that Matthew needed to graduate from BYU. And I had had several associations, and I don't want to get more specific than that, of people I knew who previously, who, who basically said, if I know if I knew of a gay person graduating from BYU, I would call and complain that my tithing dollars are going and graduating these gay kids. And, and so that, that um, cowed me. And so we just told, Matthew, and, and Matthew wasn't quite ready to come out, but he started telling certain people who deserved to know. And Liz and I became active in the all community down here in Arizona. And so we had lots of friends who were connected, but we weren't telling members of the ward. Uh, we didn't tell my parents. We, didn't, we told some of our family members, but we weren't really telling certain people who we, who we weren't sure how they were gonna react. And, and really almost nobody in our ward. We, there was a selective few over a period of time, um, but no, almost nobody for those, for those two years. And honestly, it, we were in the closet, and it was really, mm. we were not honest. Is Matthew dating anyone? Oh, no, no. I mean, it just, it was so, I, I didn't like those two years. And when Matthew, the day Matthew graduated, Liz gave a talk at the all, at our all convention, I remember. And it, it was such a relief. It was like when Matthew came out to us, all of the burden was off of his shoulders and on us, and we were able to take all of that burden and stick it onto all of our, our all of our loved ones out in the audience. And anyway, that's. I like the imagery of that because you felt an ounce of what your son was yes. feeling mm -hmm. this whole time. This yes. closeted nature of. of and, and probably just an ounce. Just an and ounce. And it was yeah. horrible. It was not a good experience. We felt like we were lying. We feel like we were not being truthful. We didn't feel honest. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't like it. When we talk about, especially in this space, authenticity and honesty, I think what you just described is one of the best ways of helping someone who isn't intimately involved in this topic understand what it means when we say living an authentic life. Yeah. Um, there's a book called The Velvet Rage that I recommend to a lot of gay dads who are coming out and navigating this journey. And uh, the, there's a section in, in the book that talks about authenticity and in, in terms of um, receiving compliments and, and accepting adulation. The, the, the premise behind it is that when you're closeted and, and fake and hiding all these things and allowing all this stuff to build upon your shoulders, when someone does praise you and compliment you for the good things that you do, you can't accept that because it feels so inauthentic. If they really knew who I was, yeah. would they accept the uh, um, the accolade or, or accept that what I did really was me. And you hide behind that fortress that you've created and it, and it just continues to weigh. You know, if someone deserves an Oscar or an Academy Award, it's often those who have been closeted for many years because they have, they have played a part. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they have acted for so long that sometimes they forget who they are. And yeah. so I, I recognize that, especially within your own situation. Um, and that coming out experience for parents is, is important. Um, to the community, just kind of some rapid fire advice. Um, Todd, to someone who listens to this podcast who um, is 
not yet willing to accept that the LGBTQ community should be an equal part of our society. Um, what would your advice be to that person? You don't want to hold it down to. I said, deal with it. It's, you know, it, it's your son, your daughter. You have to deal with it and let everybody else know that you're dealing with it. A lot of people want to keep, keep it to themselves. It took me, like I said, about a half an hour to figure out that I'm going to deal with it and let them let everybody know, you know, he's, he says he's gay, then let everybody know and deal with him on it also. And I think it is important to highlight the uh, nature of change, that this isn't something that changes. This isn't right. something it's that just is altered by environment, experience, mm -hmm. even love won't mm -hmm. change the sexuality or gender identity of your child. And that the you're bypassing a years worth of therapy and years worth of, of individual experience by just saying, you're either going to do it now or in 15 years, wouldn't it be better to do it today yeah. and move on with that? Uh, same question, Tim. What is your advice to someone who just has a hard time grasping this, this topic? Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to recognize that it can't, it, it can't be hard because, I mean, I suppose I'd made some intellectual progress on it over the years because of gay people I had known, but I was not really changed, honestly, until it affected me, until I heard my son tell me that he was gay and, and I processed what, what that meant and I believed him, right? And so to me, the, the best thing anyone can do is, is and I, I guess let's go back to something I said earlier, but just hear stories. Please take the time to ask a, you know, an LGBTQ person uh, about their experience or, or, or their loved ones or to listen to podcasts. Uh, just please just listen to stories. I think, I think it's Brene Brown that says something like, you can't hate, it's hard to hate people close up or something like that, right? And that's how it is. I mean, you hear, the, you hear a story and multiple stories, and if you take the, but that does take an investment. You have, it has to be something you care about enough to take time to hear a story. A story isn't something you can, you know, click on the CNN.com and, and ingest it in three minutes like we're used to nowadays. You do have to take the time to, to sit down and, and hear a story and a lot of stories. And th that'll change your heart. I, 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 I cannot imagine anyone who takes the time to listen to LGBTQ stories not having to change your heart. Yeah, I, I feel I did a lot right when Matthew came out and even though we had that complicated space, one thing I did wrong is I demanded in my head that everybody think like me, that everybody accept my son like I accept my son. And that just made me angry and that made me not like people and that made me frustrated, and um, I did that wrong. And since, you know, that was probably in the first year, I believe. I was, I, I was very frustrated. It was, I was on these sites, but I was angry at other people who seemed more loving to people of positions that were not like mine, and I, and I was just frustrated. I wanted to prove everybody I wanted to convince, I wanted to be the lawyer that convinced everybody that I was right and they were wrong. Um, I have found that I want people to give me and my family space. I have to give them space. And I don't ever think that someone is just gonna buy what I have to say right off the, right off the bat. And I, I give them that grace. And I, I really, I, I try to do that on not only this level, but I do that ideologically too. Um, if people want to hear what I have to say, I'll be happy to say it, but I will, but I'm okay with whatever they're, whatever they walk away with. And I don't demand them to accept my position with regard to my son, because you know what, I'll, my son and I have each other and we have our community and, and we'll hold each other a little bit tighter if that person doesn't want to be a part of it. If they want to be a part of it and they can kind of grasp it, 
then I'm more than happy to, to talk to them more. But I'll, I'll, I just will, will respect their space. Parents who are just coming to terms with all of this, they need to give themselves a break because they are there. They're, they're, that, they're that side who have only been taught that there's something wrong with this space. And we have to give them a little bit of chance. These parents just need to give themselves a break. And likewise, we need to give the parents of people who only have straight kids in their life a little bit of a break to understand us. I, I think that's sage advice. And I have this uh, same, I offer that same advice to the LGBTQ community as well. Often they've had 10, 15, 20 years to navigate this journey quietly, but mm -hmm. um, in detail and fervently, they've studied this out. And when they sit down with parents, they usually react based off of a 20 second reaction. Yeah. And so that's difficult for the parents when their sons or daughters don't get the response they had expected. And the reality is, to the LGBTQ person, you've spent a lot of time trying to understand your world. You have to give um, some, some birth and some leverage to your parents. Yes. They deserve that. Yeah. Um, to be forgiving yeah. and allow your parents to, to learn and grow in this space. And, and likewise, we have to do that with members of our church, yes. with members mm -hmm. of our community, and... and um, between that and sharing stories, hearts will change. I just, I just believe that. Paradigms are hard to change, and that's the only way I know how to change a paradigm. Yeah, and I think we've nailed those, those topics so well. Just when you know better, you do better. When you see people, the, the Brene Brown quote, um, it's really difficult to hate someone that you're close yeah. to. And it's really difficult to not understand them when you take the time to understand them. Yeah. Um, and that empathy is really powerful. Uh, what haven't we discussed um, that you think is important for parents to learn that you learned uh, along this journey or that you feel is still a blind spot in your own world that you still have yet to learn? Is there something that, we're, that we should bring up in just the last part of the podcast? Um, I think one, one thing that an LDS parent needs to realize is um, God's big and you can make these worlds work together. You don't have to choose between your kids and your religion if you don't want to choose between your religion and your kids. You can make those things work. Um, I have had my son sometimes question why I'm still a member of the church, for example. But when he, re and, 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 and when he realizes what we're trying to do from the inside of, you know, from maybe the outside edge of the inside, <laughs> You know, we are trying to help facilitate. We, someone has to be there to convey the stories, to let people know that their story is there. And I just think that there's, there's more movement. But if, if you think of it as black and white, if you think of it as a binary choice, n nothing's binary in this world. Everything is, there, there's gray and, and there's nuance. And, and I think that's important for parents to realize too. Life is not going to be over when you have a gay kid. Life is going to be grander, better. You are going to learn more about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I refuse to believe in gray. I've, I've, <laughs> I only think in rainbow now. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. I even like that better. I even like that better. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. There are far more colors. There are. And there's that whole spectrum of, of positions. And so, anyway. And I, just, I do think that a lot of parents just think, oh, no, empty chair at the table. The, all, of this, all of this effort in this world is going to be over with. The, the celestial kingdom is going to not be happy. And I just, I just really believe all of that's going to take care of ourselves, keep, take care of itself. And we're going to just, we just work on loving our family, loving our neighbors, um, giving each other space, giving each other grace. And anyway, that's it. Mm. I like it. Yeah, I guess I, I would echo Eric in the sense that uh, I think every parent should give themselves the space to make mistakes and uh, to let love guide them uh, because uh, you're not going to do it perfectly. You're just not. And uh, so listen, forgive yourself, and give yourself some space. 
Uh, I'll just add because you know if if there are any listening who are like me, I am I am definitely sort of dialed into the, the-, the theological aspects of of uh, you know what my son's orientation means, and I've and it's not, so I wrestle with it all the time and have. And um, I guess I would just add that for me, and I hope this can be a, uh, a, a useful thought for others. We believe that God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Uh, that notion uh, gives me the hope to hold on to the core of what I believe without um, uh, losing my, my sort of spiritual uh, roots entirely while I'm really wrestling dissonant, difficult, difficult, dissonant things in my, in my brain. Uh, holding on to the hope that God is big, that, um, that revelation is real, and that we're, we, we're, we've got a lot wrong, but there is hope. <laughs> that's a little package of how I, <laughs> that's a little package of how I hold true to sort of my, my core spirituality uh, without losing my brain, yeah. And I like that, I, um, <clears throat> as, you, as you were talking about the, that article of faith, first thing I, re, I remembered and, and thought of was the family proclamation, and that's often something that's used against the LGBTQ community except one line um, after it goes through all of the, um, the responsibilities and roles and gender. And, and uh, I, I like that um, after, after the proclamation extends all of its um, pretenses to its people, there's one line that says, and other circumstances may, ne- uh, other, other circumstances may necessitate individual adaptation. And I think that line is often missed in the proclamation that there's even space there for rainbow. Yep. That our circumstances require some additional adaptation. Yep. That this is much larger than, than we give it credit for. And if indeed um, a loving God made us and your children this way, uh, to believe that was a mistake would to lend itself to believe that God makes mistakes, and that's not within our realm of theology either. No, I, I, I actually like what you said. I think that last line is not even read most of the time. People get tired of reading <laughs> or something. They, they read everything but that last line, or they, or they just don't think that that line can apply to situations like this when there's no reason why it shouldn't apply. There's no footnote saying here are the situations yeah. by which this should apply. Yeah. It's, it's unabraded. Yeah. Individual adaptation. And you know what? Documents like the Family Proclamation are supposed to be documents of hope. And there's, there's great hope. And it, does, it, it has some great advice for heterosexual couples. It doesn't, you know, okay, great. But it just doesn't have any application to this situation. And that sentence has application to this. In fact, my my stake president, when we went in and told him, after we started coming out to everybody, he basically said, you know what? Revelation about your family is with you and Liz, and don't worry about the other stuff. This is the most important. And we grasped onto that, and. Um, we appreciated that, mm. that, that information from him because uh, it, it, just, it just was very loving of our state president. I like it. All right, last and final words. I don't want you to speak to the podcast audience. I want your last and final words for this episode to be to your sons. Mm. What would you tell them? What haven't you told them? Um, I don't know if I haven't told him any of this, but I am just extremely proud of the progress my son has made. I am hurt that when he was six years old and realized he was gay and he cried when he was 16 because he needed to start dating. And I had a policy in the home saying that 
just to become a good dater, I think you should date once a month. <laughs> Here I'm forcing them into it without even knowing. Um, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just thrilled that he realized that skies were the limit for him. And he has fully accepted himself. He, he, you know, we all have issues to deal with. I'm sure he has his own issues to deal with as a human being. But I'm just extremely proud of, of where he is in this life. And we just cheer him every single day. We cheer all of our kids. And we don't cheer him any less uh, as a gay man going to graduate school. I would say to my son, Mark, if you're listening, um, I love you, I am proud of you, and I am grateful that you've given me an opportunity to grow in my life in ways that I hadn't predicted but I wouldn't give up for the world. Um, if I could share it real quickly, Kyle, uh, I had an experience with Mark a few months ago where he came in. He came into the house uh, in a cross mood, and uh, he kind of, you know, got into a little tiff with his sister. And I gave him the riot act a little bit. And it's funny how when your emotions are high like that, we ended up going off to the side and having a conversation. And and one of the things he shared with me was that. Uh, how hard it was for him when he would come over the house and like he would see, you know, maybe his siblings that had a, a spouse or a boyfriend and they could let their hand rest on their, their opposite sex significant others or spouse's hand tenderly and no one thought any of it, anything of it. But to him, he was always self-conscious of that. Uh, as much as I've tried to grow, I had to really look inside myself and say, yeah, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. I have been. And those, those realizations are, pain, they're painful for me, but I, I mean, imagine his pain. But the pain for me was, holy crap, Tim, you don't have no clue what he's experienced. Like you have no clue the depth of his pain when he can't let his hand rest on his boyfriend's hand because he's worried that his dad is gonna walk out of the room or is gonna read his body language to be something different. And I just wept with him. <laughs> I just wept with him because it just dawned on me just what it was every little experience, you know? And I got just this little window into it. And uh, Mark, I'm sorry for that. I love you with all my heart and I'm doing my best to change. That's what I would say to my son. Yeah. Thank you. Todd. I got so much easier than you guys do. <laughs> I just <clears throat> accepted him right away after the first half hour. And whenever we go to work, go somewhere, do anything, it's I love you, Dad. I love you, Blue. Have a good time. And it's, it's love in our family. We have our problems, you know, about him not cleaning up after himself or doing this thing. But when we leave to go to work, get home, I love you, Dad. Love you, Blue. One more thing. If there was a button that I could push to reset everything and make Matthew straight, I wouldn't push it. And I would, I tell him that. I am a better person because of who he is. I am a better person because of what we have been through with him and the rest of our family. Um, I wouldn't change it. Not, n not at all. Ditto. Yeah. Ditto. Ditto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. There you go. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. I think we've had an enlightening hour. I hope that those who participate in this podcast, who listen to it, um, have been able to glean something, uh, learn something they didn't know before. I also hope that it inspires them to do exactly what you've asked them to do, and that's to become closer to the stories and get to understand and know the individuals behind this topic. When we know better, we do better, and we have to do better than we're doing today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. The Latter Gay Stories podcast, again, your opportunity to better understand this intersection of sexuality and reality. 
If you have a question for any of these dads, we invite you to share that. If you are watching on a video version, uh, we invite you to make that comment below and let's have a real-time discussion about their experience and maybe your experience as well. If you are listening on the audio version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and uh, keep, uh, by subscribing, you'll uh, keep in touch and, and uh, as each new episode is released, you'll be able to be able, uh, get the alert uh, that new episodes are forthcoming. One of the greatest ways we can um, help share this message is uh, by interacting with it, especially on social media and getting it into the hands of people who can learn from messages just like these dads. Again, I want to thank them uh, for giving us an hour of their time to share this message. The Latter-day Stories podcast is our opportunity to build bigger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ communities, but most importantly, it's stories just like this that help us to continue writing our latter-day stories.